compare properly. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Greater yeah. Melbourne's population is five, just sitting on five million, and I think you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's Great Greater Melbourne. Yeah, that's the, the, the city, city plus the suburbs. Yeah. The population. This is about the same. It's about the same, yeah. same size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that compare to Sydney? Uh, Sydney is about six million. So six, Sydney is the largest city in um, Australia. Then Melbourne, Melbourne is the second biggest city. Um, but at, neither of those are our capital cities. Our capital city is Canberra, which is halfway right. between Melbourne and Sydney. And the reason is Melbourne and Sydney couldn't agree on who, who, who should be the capital. <laughs> so we decided to build something halfway between and kind of come to a compromise. There's a lot of rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne. It's warm. Yeah. Now, Melbourne. some of you have been to Melbourne, I believe. I know that Joel and Elaine have. Have any, yeah. anyone else been to Melbourne? Yeah. No. no. Yes. Wish yeah. Would love to. Well, I do hope you can come come one day when all this is over. <laughs> what, what's your crime rate in uh, in the different cities? The crime cri crime rate. Crime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I don't have I, I I don't have that figure on the tip of my tongue. I know. It is fairly low compared to um, mm -hmm. other cities around the world, but it would be probably, I think it's about, I think it is after Sydney, it would be the next one. Would, there's something like five per 100,000, five per 100,000. Does that sound like the number that we're looking for? Well, we, we had 800 homicides last year, 2021. Right. So we yeah, like no, live in Beirut. We, we live in Beirut, uh, my husband said. Yeah. So should we yeah. move? Not I'm not sure either. Beirut may be safer. <laughs> well, look, look at yeah, look it is. I would say um, hom murders or yep. something murders right. wouldn't happen at the moment more than one a week. Um, say when things are normal, it might be two or three a week in mm -hmm. Melbourne. So it's it certainly makes headlines if if there is a murder um, in Melbourne. It's not something that just go oh another one. You know, it certainly is quite significant. Um, yeah. Three a week we get. We get three a day. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's very sad, isn't it? Very yeah. sad when you're dealing the next with that. Yeah. I'll actually, I'll get those actual figures for Joel, though, just so I'm, I'm being accurate. There's some of our trams. Just showing you our trams going past. Oh, nice train. Oh, there's the train system. Yeah. So we have the biggest um, network of tram, 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 ro um, tram railways in, in the in the world. Not, yeah, so we. Yeah. About, it's going to be a walking tour, is what they told us. Oh, I should have worn my gym shoes. <laughs> Nancy's uh, ready for it. She's got your views on. Yep, oh, no, she didn't like that. Joel, you have 10, 10 participants. Yeah, we've got a couple more. We'll, we'll, we'll wait till 8 o'clock and then we'll begin. The end. I'll... Yeah, that's absolutely fine, Joel. Absolutely fine. Yep. Really? 8 yeah. or 7 o'clock, really. I mean, yeah, it's 8 o'clock yeah. here before. Yeah. yeah. We are going to move around to those. I could hear your conversation yeah. about we're going to walk. Sure. And I'll, just, I'll just sort of start in the one spot yeah. here. Yeah. Are you going to count your steps? Yeah. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Uh, if I could ask everybody to mute themselves now. Mute yourself, Gary. Hmm? Mute, mute yourself. Mute. If, if you could mute just so we don't have any interference with the clock. I heard you. you don't hear anything. Hello. Hello. Hello, all. We got a few more coming in here. Mute. That's okay. fine, Joel. Yeah. I'm just showing you our coat of arms, Melbourne's coat of arms. So we have Melbourne was built on um, the back, the sheep's back, whaling, shipping, um, speaking of migration, and the cattle industry. So that's that represents our coat of arms. We weren't a convict settlement like Sydney. We were a free pastoral settlement. And the Latin words there mean... Um, Okay. They've been um, gathering strength as we go. It's a quote from Virgil, and it's meant to um, give the idea that we're a progressive city. But when Virgil wrote those words, he was referring to the 
concept of rumours, that rumours gather strength as they go. Um, so it's a little bit of a mis misuse of the quote, I would suggest. <laughs> yeah. Now, those of you, I know you've put yourselves on mute, um, but if, feel very free to use the chat function. If you'd like to comment or ask any questions, I can pick those up as we're going along. And we'll be able to finish, um, we'll have some questions at the end as well. So time for some more discussion and questions. So for those just joining, I'm Leanne, and we'll just wait for Joel to say when we've got everyone on and ready, and uh, we can start our walking tour of Melbourne. So welcome everybody. Oh, here comes someone else. Oh, that's... We got two more joining us here. Oh, good, Joel. Yeah. So for those just joining, I'm just sort of panning around. I'm standing on Prince's Bridge, which is the southern gateway yes, into the city of Melbourne. Yeah. So I'm showing you some of the skyscrapers. We're going to walk um, towards the city when we start our tour, but I'm just sort of showing you, I guess, a perspective from the south looking into the city. And this is the Yarra River that Melbourne sits on the edge of, the main river. Looking towards where the Australian Open will be taking place next week. I was coming in this morning and a lot of the cars that transport the players and their entourage were already taking people back and forth to the hotels um, for their practice matches. Okay, Leanne, uh, I think we could start now. So people, if they come in, will join us. Yeah, that's fine, Joel. All right, well, look, thank you. We'll do that. I'll just put myself back in the camera. I will um, sort of flip between myself and taking myself out just so you can see the views. Well, welcome again, everybody. Thank you, Joel, for organising this virtual tour of Melbourne. My name's Leanne, and I'm a Tours by Locals guide, and I, I just do thank Joel for all his work in organising this. As you can tell, it's a bit windy here in Melbourne, so my hair's going to be a bit over the, all over the place today, but that's that's not that's quite okay. Yeah, so welcome to Melbourne. As I said, um, we're a city of 5 million people. That's Greater Melbourne with about 100,000 people that live in the CBD here. So we're going to take a walk through some of our perhaps iconic buildings and sites. Um, through some of our laneways that Joel Joel made, we had a meeting last week and Joel um, particularly asked if we could see some of the things that he'd really enjoyed seeing when he and Elaine um, came to Melbourne. So that's what um, we're going to do today. Look, the connection should be fairly good. Joel and I had a test last week and I've done quite a lot of these virtual tours now, but if for some reason I drop out or you drop out, all we've got to do is just click and rejoin the meeting. So. Um, hopefully there's no problems like that, but feel very free. I, I deliberately don't walk too fast or hopefully not talk too fast just so that we can, all of that streaming is uh, quite good as well. I'm just going to flip my camera now because I'm walking towards um, what's called Federation Square. Yeah, and as I said, just any questions or comments, you can put them into chat or jot, jot them down and we can um, have some discussion um, at the end of the tour. So I'm um, standing in Federation Square. This, and I'll show you a little bit more of this now. Exactly. This is our main public square or public meeting place in Melbourne. Melbourne was very well planned out. It was settled in 1835, which I think is a similar age to Chicago as well. I was looking at um, comparing some of the history of Chicago and I, you may, there may have been perhaps a small settlement in Chicago before that, but I think when in terms of when it became a, a more official settlement, Melbourne and Chicago it was all happening around the around the same time. And also there, it, both both of our cities, there was quite a bit of thought given to uh, planning things out. So a very, very wide, big public space. This is the size of a whole city block. Run. And I can't get the full picture of you. That's someone on iPad. You might just need to uh, click on full screen there, the person who's asking about that. Click on full yep. screen. Yeah, so Federation Square was built to commemorate 100 years of Federation. This here is actually a TV screen. They've just got some advertising on it at the moment. Not a not your regular rectangular screen, is it? It's just 
got lines and things. Uh, a lot of free events happen here. Um, we, our, one of our galleries, our Australian Art Gallery, is in the square there at the back where the black building covered in black with the satellite dishes on top. Just get rid of that there. Um, we've got a stage here where there's free performances and another screen above there. So when the Australian Open is on, um, that will be broadcast there and people will be able to come and sit. They often bring out some deck chairs and people um, just really enjoy sitting, sitting in this space. All of the stone on the ground has come from Outback Australia. So if you've heard of Uluru or Ayers Rock, um, Central Australia, all of that rock has come from there. So these are very much the colours of the Outback. Mm -hmm. And we've got the SBS, which is the Special Broadcasting Service. That's the um, foreign language uh, broadcasting television and radio in Melbourne. We're very multicultural um, in Melbourne. Over, two, over 200 uh, languages and countries are represented here. So I'll just take a walk back here. Now, the, underneath us is um, an underground train network that goes under the, um, under, the, under the deck here that I'm standing on. And we've got the art gallery with lots of precious art and we have that broadcasting service. So the floor had to be very, um, very well engineered to, um, so that you know, the sound and the vibration didn't impact on, I'll just come back into view for a minute, didn't impact on, the, on those things there. So I'm just trying to tap the camera so it'll come back to me. There we go. <laughs> just so you know, I'm here still. Everything is okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, as I said, federation means when all of our separate states um, and territories, a bit like America, you have your 50 states. Australia has six states, two main territories. Then we have a lot of island um, territories and a couple of military bases as well. And all of those um, came together to be um, come under the one nation of Australia. And that happened in 1901. So this, this square, Fed Square or Federation Square, commemorates 100 years of that. It was built um, in 2001 to commemorate, to commemorate Federation. Now I'm just going to flip again, just so you can see Flinders Street Station. This is one of Melbourne's mm -hmm. iconic buildings, um, just over the road. And we'll get the best view actually, as we um, I kind of duck around that a little bit. A lot of construction going on in Melbourne at the moment. We're building an extension to our underground train network, ah. uh, which means we've got a lot of things like this. I'll just sort of show you here. Yeah. This um, construction here, they actually, it's called an acoustic shed. And what they do is cover the, where they cut for the stations. It's not for the tunnels, it's just for the stations to keep the dust and the noise down. Uh, there's, there's nothing much that I can hear there today. As we cross the lights, just have a look at the signals because these um, signals have got female figures. Most of our pedestrian lights are male, here we go. But this one is a female and it was kind of just an acknowledgement of the International Year of Women. I'm just gonna pan that up so you can see that. It's a figure of, then it's changed. So all of our others um, right around Melbourne are men, not women. So something a little bit quirky uh, that you'll find in Melbourne. I understand a word. So coming across, I'm just going to show you the view of the station from the corner yeah. Yeah. as we head around. Yeah, so as I said, Melbourne was established in 1835. Um, there were Indigenous people here first. You might have heard of them as the Aboriginal people, but they've very much got their own tribes and clans and culture and language and practices. And... Um, the people from this particular area are called the Wurundjeri people. Um, the spelling's complicated, but I can, I can put that into um, the chat later. I'm just going to show you what the station, this is kind of an image that if you see pictures of Melbourne, um, this is one that you do often see. Linders Street Station, it's the main suburban railway station for Melbourne. So all of the suburban train lines come through here. And as a local, if we say, I'll meet you under the clocks, those clocks are very old, very original. Um, they, yeah, some, mostly they work. They look like they're working today. Um, so all we say as a local is, um, I'll meet you under the clocks. 
and we we just know that that's where we'll meet at Flinders Street Station. Even the seats are heat, oh, the the steps are heated at the station, so you can sort of sit there and wait for your friend or loved one. On the diagonal corner is St Paul's Cathedral, so that's our main Anglican cathedral in Melbourne. And I'm told that the spires. I'm just going to flip back to to me again. The spires of that cathedral are the tallest on any Anglican cathedral um, outside of England. I believe Salisbury Cathedral in England has the tallest spires on an Anglican church. And then the next tallest spire is this one on St. Paul's. I'll just cross over and show you another view of that. Of course, Anglican, the Anglican religion was the main predominant. In fact, it still is. Um, if you did ask people today, um, perhaps religion is, is, people don't often say they're of any particular religion these days, but if they do, um, Anglican would still be the predominant religion. Just showing you the cathedral again there behind these beautiful plane trees. We have lots of beautiful trees um, lining our streets in Melbourne. And this is our main northwest street. And there's no traffic allowed on this street. Trams are and service vehicles and pedestrians, of course, but uh, that road has been closed to traffic for about 30, about 30 years that I can recall. Um, I've lived in Melbourne for all of my adult life and I've lived in the state of Victoria for all of my life. So I'm very much, you know, born and bred here, kind of in my, in my DNA. I just also want to show you again, perhaps a link with Chicago. Uh, this is Young and Jackson's Hotel. So this is also on a corner, on the corner of Flinders Street and Swanson Street. Sorry, the sun's there. So it says the site of the Prince's Bridge Hotel to, or Young and Jackson's that's purchased for 100 pounds at the first Melbourne land auction in, now the date is 1837. A bit hard to see the uh, with the sun shining there by John Batman, founder of this great city. So he is credited with being uh, the founder of Melbourne, John Batman. He, um, just going to flip back to myself here as we move along. There we go. Yeah, John Batman came up the Yarra River in 1835 and he came from Tasmania. He was an ex-convict. And he was looking for that pastoral land because Tasmania and Sydney were hemmed in by uh, mountains and forests that were fairly impenetrable. So they were looking for somewhere to set up um, agricultural industries. And he came up the river and he noticed a very wide part of the river, just uh, not far from where we started off. He saw all this beautiful pastoral land and he had a supply, found a supply of fresh water and he famously said, this will be um, a place for a village. And that's really how, how Melbourne started. Yeah, and since then, we've, you know, we had a gold rush in 1850s that backed onto the Californian gold rush in America. So as that was starting to wane a little bit, uh, Melbourne, we found gold not far from Melbourne. A lot of the topography was very similar. And so the geologists were kind of recognizing that, hey, there could be gold could be gold here as well. Okay, now we're coming up to Flinders Lane. I'm just going to show you in Melbourne, we have a system of, it's called the Hoddle Grid. And it has, it's, it's one mile long and half a mile wide. And it sort of alternates with these narrow streets. So this is the lane way. We're going to take a walk down this one with um, the wide streets. They're very wide. They're about 99 foot wide, the main streets and the small ones, the laneway, we call them laneways, are uh, 30, 33 foot wide. And so that when they designed the grid, all the nice shop fronts were meant to be um, on the big wide streets and all the uh, rubbish and the sewerage and all the things that you don't want people to see publicly um, are all, all happening at the back streets. Well, these days, our laneways have been converted into uh, beautiful um, sort of cafes that pop out of the walls, artisan shops. And, you know, people love poking around the city. In fact, you can go around the whole city 
really without going on the main streets. I just want to show you this lovely arcade here. This is the Nicholas building. Now I'm not going to go in because if I do, we'll lose the connection. But I just, um, I think I can show you that beautiful uh, mm. lead light mm. roof. Mm -hmm. It's called the Nicholas building. The Nicholas brothers invented the tablet form of Aspro. Um, so that's headache tablet. So they made a great fortune on that. And they built this building that was actually inspired by Chicago architecture. Um, yeah. with, and it's the yeah. only arcade we have that's got some lead light um, on the roof and the idea of bringing the shops inside so that women in their long dresses didn't get, you know, lots of mud and things like that on their clothing. And people could really kind of showcase, showcase the shops. Right where I'm standing, though, in 1931, there was a robbery. And I'm just going to flip back to myself again. A robbery, robbery there and a group of gangsters, I think it was about four gangsters, came and relieved um, the security guards of nearly a thousand pounds of cash from a nearby store. They were caught and sentenced to 20 years jail, but significantly they were also sentenced to um, the cat of nine tails. They had to have 15 lashes each of the cat of nine tails. So sounds a bit barbaric these days, doesn't it, to get kind of whipped for, <laughs> for um, stealing. But yeah, I guess that was quite a strong deterrent. Just showing you another laneway off a laneway here. Um, so this is called Scott Alley. And again, just an example of little cafes that sort of pop up in these hidden away uh, laneways here. There's a couple of French creperies um, in there. But I just want to show you a couple of quite pretty ones as we walk down here. So I'm in Flinders Lane. The streets go Flinders Street, Flinders Lane, Collins Street, Little Collins Street. So after that, they all it's the main street, and then the, the laneway has like a little, a little name in front of it. Yeah, but this next one's lovely. We're heading to DeGrave Street. Yeah, in the 1970s, they, the, the city council decided to really reinvigorate. Uh, Melbourne a lot of people were starting to move into the city once upon a time when I was growing up you would never hear of anyone who wanted to live in the city they were happy to come in and work here and shop here but not live here but as people started to do that they really wanted to sort of create that more Eu European village um, kind of atmosphere here so on one end of this is now de Graves Street but I just want to show you this uh, lovely Mallorca building with some lovely architecture on the outside um, it looks like beautiful blue marble. It was actually designed by the same people who designed that Nicholas building where I just showed you the arcade before. And it's actually just kind of a blue raked stone. It's not necessarily, it looks quite opulent, but it's not, um, it looks, looks fancier than what it really is. There we go, DeGrave Street, just so you know where you are. And then on DeGrave Street, we have these beautiful um, sort of hoardings that are all sort of the same shape. How, how are you there, sir? Just saying hello to a local there <laughs> as we're going along. So I'm just gonna take you for a little walk along here. Um, coming to life today, this is lunchtime and people are coming out for, for lunch. So again, these tiny tucked away um, backs of buildings have sort of been converted into these lovely um, kind of very small bes bespoke cafes. All right, you want to sit down with me here? Yeah, often there's more, there's more seating outside than inside quite often in these places. And it just come down a bit further and you can see some more of these lovely hoardings as well. So this is one, one this was one of the first laneways to sort of be converted into, you know, from just an out of the way, nothing much happening to all these beautiful little shops. I'm just going to pan up and show you um, some of these hoardings. And at the other end, the end that I'm showing you now, that's Flinders Street Station again. So the, this particular laneway is sort of bookmarked or bookended by um, some really lovely buildings at either end. And you can see some of those lovely hoardings there. Um, sadly, of course, like every city, you know, we've been affected by COVID. And in fact, probably one of the most difficult things for our traders at the moment is getting enough staff because our... Um, testing conditions for COVID are quite strict. And if anyone tests for COVID, they have to isolate 
um, or even have a close contact, they have to isolate for, for at least seven days. So a lot of these restaurants and cafes and shops are um, having to close or have short hours because they can't get staff. It's not so much um, there's people around, but which is making it difficult. You'll see um, we have quite a bit of street art in our laneways and in Melbourne, um, in most laneways, you are allowed to, anyone's allowed to come and put Laneway. some street art up. Street. Street. So if any of you have got pet cats, quite cute there. Um, yeah, you're allowed, there's no sort of penalty for doing um, what some people would call graffiti, but the idea is to encourage people to do, do it in these designated areas of the laneways, the street art, rather than just do it anywhere. So I'm sort of, I've turned around now to show you to Grave Street, people having their lunch. So certainly if you come to Melbourne, this is a really nice one to check out um, here. And all the locals sort of have their favourite places. We're very much coffee snobs in Melbourne. We love our coffee. And that was brought here by the Italian immigrants in the 1940s. And it's something that we, um, you know, we always check out the brands. Sometimes we want our own blends and, you know, it's almost, um, almost a culture in itself. So far, um, I'm under coffee. Yeah. Coffee. As I said, feel free to put anything into the chat that you've got anything that you're, asked, you're curious about. That's called Centre Place. Another little one. I'm not going up that one because I know the connection will get a bit dodgy there. That's called Centre Place. And we could walk through that one into um, a, another laneway, but I'm just going to take you um, back to one that I know the connection will be a little bit better. Yeah, not on. Yeah, this, this cafe is called Brunetti, a very famous Italian cafe in Melbourne. They, they, have, um, they started in a suburb called Carlton, which is just north of the city. And they've opened one in Singapore and in Dubai in the airport there. And that's, yeah, certainly beautiful, beautiful cakes. Um, very, you know, very more about the craft really of cooking cakes than, uh, than yeah, the just having a cake. Lovely building here too. I'm just going to spin around and show you this one. The truck coming. Uh, this is called Ross House, and it's the an example, the first time in Australia where a public building or a, a building that was going to be pulled down was kind of handed over to community, no. to community groups that perhaps um, don't have a lot of money. So perhaps a refugee oh, group or a climate change group who perhaps want to do some advocacy work but don't have uh, a lot of money to pay high rent. So this building is um, dedicated yeah, to that's the guy. dedicated to about thirty tenants who Excuse just me, kind of need a break me, because they're me, servicing. Yeah, yeah we sure. have one of our participants is uh, has their audio on. We need her to mute herself. Sarah Jane Orloff. Sarah Jane, could you mute your your audio? And Bob Hirsch too. That's all right. Thanks, Joel. So glad we've got Joel checking on things today. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just walking through now to um, bring you out to a, one of our most beautiful arcades where we're going to go inside and look at some beautiful architecture called the Block Arcade. So we started on Prince's Bridge and we crossed the first main street, which was Flinders Street. And now we're coming up to Collins Street. So we, sorry, Flinders Lane was the small lane in between. And now we're coming up to Collins Street. Now this is the, what we call the Paris end of Melbourne, where it's kind of the street, um, to the most expensive street. It's where still to this day, we have the dentists and the doctors have their offices um, up one end, the lawyers and the accountants, uh, very, you know, some of the headquarters of uh, National Australia Bank, for example. It's kind of the place um, where things happen in Melbourne, both socially and business-wise. You'll notice all this uh, lovely dark stone too behind me. That's called blue stone. We have a lot of um, basalt rock. Melbourne sits on a, and, and this half of Victoria, including Melbourne, sits on a volcanic plain. Um, and so a lot of this 
uh, bluestone. We call it bluestone. A lot of our buildings and roads um, are made. But, you know, we've sort of got that dark bluestone look um, to Melbourne. I'm just going to flip the camera around again so you can see where we are now. So this part, this is Collins Street now um, to my right. And this is this particular part of Collins Street is called The Block, The Block. Uh, there's a TV show called The Block as well in Melbourne called where they renovate houses, a reality TV show. But this is a bit different. When settlement first happened, what the men and ladies would do, particularly the ladies, they would dress up on a Saturday afternoon and a Sunday afternoon after church, of course, dress up in their finest clothes. I'm talking in the early 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, dress up and they would walk the block. Now that means they would walk along this, do a rectangle um, up and down this road and across this particular street, Collins Street. And they would more or less um, promenade and kind of show off or put on their best front and the men would go in one direction and the ladies would go in the other. And of course, they would be checking each other out. Women were a little bit in short supply in the early days. And so it was kind of the social occasion and it's often where many, uh, many men and women met their future wives and husbands. So the arcade we're going to go into is called the Block Arcade and it's named after um, the social phenomena that was walking the block is what they would call it. Here we go, just crossing Collins Street. Yeah, so you'll see the tram lines in front of me. As I said, there's about 400 miles of tram line um, in Melbourne. So we're just walking down and around. And the Block Arcade, it's not the oldest arcade in Melbourne or Australia the next one that we go to is but this one is modeled on um, Milan's uh, in, in Vittorio, Eman Milan's Vittorio Emmanuel arcade and they have verified that it is very much um, like their arcades. I'm just going to show you the entrance to it called the Block Arcade. Certainly um, yeah I, I love visiting here all the time even as a local it's just a real treat um, to come here. It's got this beautiful tessellated floor. Um, these tiles have come from Italy. And in fact, we have, we always have plenty of spares of these tiles so that um, if any need replacing, um, they can easily, you know, the, we have the right colours um, so that it doesn't look like, um, yeah, it doesn't look like it's a patch job. It always looks like it's been beautifully, um, beautifully restored. You're not, not allowed to walk through here with um, really high hills or metal spikes. I ride a bike quite a lot, um, but I, I'm not, I don't ride through with my cleated shoes. Um, this shop is Opatani, but I'm just going to pan up and show you a beautiful uh, mural on the roof in there. And that was, the mural was added in 1908 and it was designed to sort of show advances in tech, tech or sort of a, um, symbol, symbol is symbolic of the um, developments in science and technology. We're going to take a walk inside. And again, on this roof on the other shop, it's a shoe shop today, but they have a beautiful uh, pressed metal ceiling on that side. It's beautiful and quiet. Um, it's got a lovely aroma about it because there's some herb shops, uh, spices and um, tea and coffee. There's a lovely tea room here as well. And yeah, it's just, and again, the, this was one of the first places where you would you know, bring the shops inside and really use the shop front to really show off um, your wares. Very famous tea rooms here. I'm not sure if Joel and Elaine, whether you might have visited here when you came into yeah. Melbourne. Yes, yes, we did. We remember you that. You did. Very... There you go. So I hope that's bringing back some memories for you. Uh, a beautiful glass etched mirror that was specifically customised for the premises and the wallpaper was also specially designed uh, for this uh, cafe as well. Known for their high teas, you know, where you sort of get the tears of cakes and savouries um, dishes. They brought a lot more of the um, tables outside because of COVID, because it is quite a little small um, poke. I'll just take you up to show you the cakes up close. 
And there's actually a little model of uh, people having little, little model of a man and a woman having their afternoon tea. That's actually a little bit animated. The lady's hands, when you said before, have a cuppa. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly what they're doing. So very much an English tradition. And these are all the real cakes on offer. I hope you've all had your dessert tonight for dinner. Um, I'm just trying to find something that might be quite Australian. Uh, look, that one there looks a bit like a black forest. I know that doesn't sound Australian, does it? But we do like black forest, that roulade there. Pavlova is one of our big dishes. We love pavlova. That's a cheesecake. This one's a hibiscus cheesecake. So they're using something in the flour there to, and some pistachio on the side. So yeah, my mouth's watering just looking at all that. <laughs> yeah, but, and again, beautiful um, roof line. I'm just going to pan up to show you that. Not the lead light like was in the Nicholas building, but some beautiful ironwork. Um, those lights look like they're flickering, but they're not. It's just the way the uh, video is working there. And some of those, sort of bluey colored decorations. I think they're still left over from Christmas. I can see some poinsettia up there as well. I think don't think those lights will stay there um, all the time. And they have some lovely music playing, sort of classical music. So you sort of really feel like you're stepping back in time um, when you walk into this beautiful arcade. And this is we're coming up to the center of it now. I think they had a Santa sitting here over Christmas from memory. I came in a couple of times over Christmas and then it has, it's an L shape. So you're actually looking now at the uh, wing of the L shape. If we were here on the hour um, up the top, those, those model buglers um, would kind of just do a little animation and fanfare as well. Joel and Elaine, I think, Elaine, you're nodding. You might remember that as well. There you go. Totally, yeah. totally remember it. <laughs> oh, isn't that lovely? I'm so glad we can show you something we that you've too. seen before. Yeah. I probably won't go down the whole way there. We'll keep going just so I can keep showing you as much as I can today. Um, but again, just the way the light's coming in there now, that it's, it's midday, so the light's sort of right overhead. But of course, the idea of light field arcades was a fairly new innovation too, um, because again, it showed off everything to full advantage. Um, this one's not so pretty, the roof, but this is what's left of um, a very famous shop in Melbourne called Coles Book Arcade. It was a bit like the borders or the um, readings of the day, a very, um, a, like almost like a circus themed bookshop where, you would be attracted to come into the shop and certainly browse a lot of books, sit down and read books, hopefully buy them. Um, and he, he would have the Mr. Coles would have a menagerie of animals. He would have circus performers um, performing all to attract you into the shop. And it was quite a cultural institution again, just showing us. I really like these little bits of tile on the walls here too. Again, just some small cafes. We're officially out of Block Arcade now. This is like another little laneway that connects us to the next one, which is Royal Arcade. And it's, it's just so nice to see businesses open and people here because, um, yeah, I guess like your city, it's been particularly hard uh, the last couple of years. So now we're coming out onto Little Collins Street, so the second of our little laneways. And I'm just going to come around and cross this one. So these little laneways, they're only, um, what did I say, 33 feet wide. So they're you know, quite small. They, the tra traffic does come down these, but only in one direction. So now we're coming into Royal Arcade. And this one is the oldest um, arcade in, in Australia, actually. There's only 18 arcades in the whole world. That I'll just show you that we're in Royal Arcade where we are, so you can see that on the floor. We've got the not the red carpet, we've got the black carpet. Welcome <laughs> coming in. Yeah, there's only 18 arcades that predate 1870s. This one was opened in 1872. It's the oldest arcade in Melbourne and links beautifully with the uh, block arcade that we've just come from. This quite different, you can tell the difference between the two arcades by the floor, of course. We have the black and white um, sort of square checkerboard 
style of flooring here. What's special about this arcade is though, um, that they have these um, figures up on this one called Gog and Magog, uh -huh. that um, kind of, again, animate time. And I must admit they haven't been keeping super accurate time lately. It's just gone past the half hour, but certainly on the hour, um, they're all thereabouts. They come out and they kind of bang the bell and, and do a little animation there. And they've been doing that ever since the 1870s. They really haven't changed the mechanics uh -huh. or the automation of that at all. And yeah, made the clock is by Gaunt, G-A-U-N-T. And he was a very famous uh, Melbourne clockmaker right through the mid to late 1800s, right through to the early and mid uh, 1900s. Again, lots of beautiful sort of shops. We've got um, some candle shops here and a few, that Chocomama is a bit of a shame that one's closed. That was uh, a Melbourne chocolate shop, although our, Mel our Melbourne brand of chocolate is just up the road here. I'll just take you slowly up here. Um, again, some of those um, kind of curtain lights that are hanging down, that's all um, to do with Christmas. That's not always there. The Christmas tree is still there as well. So I can remember coming, you know, as a little girl, I'd come here with my grandmother and do some really special shopping. And uh, as a little girl living in the country, these kind of shops were just really um, quite amazing. The one over there, the road that I've just, the one I'm showing you now with kind of the white on the windows, that's actually an art installation called Flash Forward. So an artist came in and has just drawn um, quite fine detail. Um, her name, just in case you needed to see the name there, Gozia uh, Waldark, I think it is, Waldazark. Don't know lots about her, but I know she's, when, I, when you look at it in detail, it looks all scribbly, but she's sort of just picked up things like the boots there, um, a mm. pet dog. Um, mm. so you've just got, the more you look at it, the more you see. And that's just sort of something um, temporary to sort of attract people into the arcade as well. And Coco Black, this is Melbourne's brand of chocolate and one of the, you know, a really high quality chocolate. They do a lot of, you know, the bush food type of flavours. Um, we have a lot of rooftop honey in Melbourne and there's a lovely little beehive uh, chocolate you can buy in there. And things like wattle seed and pepperberry, they're all native plants. There's a tram coming past at the end. Um, so, yeah, so this one's Royal Arcade. The first um, arcade there was Block, Block Arcade and then Royal Arcade. You can, as I said, I used to come to university in Melbourne. I'd get off the train at Flinders Street. And I'd walk often, you know, take this path to university because it was just more interesting um, than, you know, going on the main streets. You see the sign on the trams, made in Melbourne. So we actually make all the trams here in Melbourne. You see that coming up. And all of our trams run on solar energy. So they're all um, totally off the, or they run off the, yeah, solar power energy grid. So there's no um, sort of fossil fuels used for there. You'll see this is Burke Street Mall. So this is our main shopping mall. And the building I'm showing you there was the general post office. We're a little bit sad and embarrassed that it's now a H&M um, clothing shop, but nevertheless, they have uh, kept the building. And then these are our two main department stores. So Maya um, Shopping Emporium, that's a um, Melbourne, it was uh, um, started by a man, Sydney Meyer, in the early 1900s. And next to hit that there is uh, the David Jones one. Now I'm just going to cross over and show you the arcade again, looking back, just so you get that view of the arcade before we walk uh, further. I'm so glad it's a lovely day here today too. Um, it's just that you can enjoy that. So that's the Burke Street entrance to Royal Arcade there. And they've, they've restored, that's the original colours. Um, you mightn't think that's a super attractive colour, but they have um, about 10 years ago, they kind of made sure all the restoration uh, was true and replicating what was there originally, just a tram coming past again. And those, when the tram's gone, I'll just show you the, um, 
that veranda over the arcades, they were kind of, they used to be along all of the, I guess, shop fronts. A lot of them now it's a bit more open, but they have kept, kept that as well. I'm just going to take you past uh, the, the post office now. One of the famous um, transport success stories in Melbourne was a company called Cobb and Co. They were kind of operating the coach travel, um, particularly to the gold rush towns that were outside of Melbourne. And that gateway there was where the coach and horses were, or the coaches yeah, and the mail coaches would actually go through to the back of the post office and collect all the mail. And then the building next door that's now Maya, that's where all the passengers would get on and they would take those uh, passengers and the mail to the gold fields. Now, Cobb was an American and he came across, um, you know, to establish a stagecoach business and it became kind of the, well, in Australia, we can kind of compare it to Qantas today, Qantas being our uh, airline company, um, because it just was a phenomenal um, success. And one of the secrets of their success was sticking to their timetable. So no matter what, if you had two get two passengers or, 100, the timetable was really important. And also they had uh, frequent changeovers of horses so that the horses were always fresh and um, you know, were ready to take on, you know, run fast, I guess, to get people there on time to their destinations. And they linked up also with the train system. So where the trains didn't go, uh, the coaches did. So they sort of were able to get business that way. Now I wanna show you this um, sculpture in front of me, um, kind of a little bit of an ironic one. There you go, it's a giant purse. <laughs> you can see the size there when people walk past. So it's called the public purse. I'll just show you the name of it on the ground there. It's called the public purse. And hopefully that sun's not too, I think you can just see that there. Um, yeah, the idea being that, oh, well, yes, the government does spend some money, I guess. And there it is, the public purse. <laughs> mm. um, and it's right in front of, as I said, the GP. I'm not sure that that's significant, the location itself, but um, it's just, and as people often come past and they use it for a seat, of course, as well. They sit on it. Okay, well, we're now going to, I'm just going to come back in front of you just to talk with you so you know that I'm still here as we walk up to Hardware Lane. The city, the street that we're crossing now is called Elizabeth Street. And it's the lowest point of the city. So I'm exactly halfway, I'm exactly half at the halfway point of the city. Um, there was a creek running through here originally. And in fact, if we still have really heavy flooding rains, this street can still flood and be perhaps about five or six feet underwater. Very rare that that happens, but something to be um, aware of. So either side of Elizabeth Street, we kind of go up a bit of a slope. I'm, I'm walking west now and I'm walking up towards um, yeah, the western side of Melbourne and behind me is the eastern side of Melbourne. And yeah, so the, there was sort of a natural creek and little bridges across Elizabeth Street in the early days. When we look back at pictures and maps of Melbourne, that kind of thing is quite evident. We have um, the second and third tallest buildings in Australia, in Melbourne. So the tallest building is called the Q1. And that's on the Gold Coast in Queensland. That's a bit like Florida to you in America. And that's about 2,000, 1,500 miles from here. So Australia and America are, very, are a very similar size geographically, but I guess just our states are less and there's less of them, but they're bigger. Um, yeah, so number two building is Australia 108, which has just been finished and the Eureka Tower, which we, they were in, actually they were in the first, when I was um, waiting for you this morning, I was panning around and you could see those, but I don't think I pointed them out to you. Okay, so we're coming up now to another laneway that's a little bit more, quite a bit more open and breezy, um, rather than sort of a bit more of a closed in feel. It's called Hardware Lane. I'll just flip the camera around so you can see as we head in there. Sorry, I touched the camera and it doesn't always flip. There we go. Hardware lane, I'm just sort of poking that up there so you can see, I've given Joel um, a map, sort of an interactive map of where we're going today. So you're very welcome to go back later and you can kind of follow the route 
again, that we've been taking. I've got some pictures in there um, that will help you just connect with what we're seeing and doing today. Now, Hardware Lane, as the name suggests, was very much the kind of, yeah, sale of hardware equipment. So things like picks and shovels for the gold rush. Um, if you needed your wheels fixed on your wagon. In fact, the original owner of lots of the land in here, he had a horse bazaar. So this is where a lot of the horses for transport were traded in those early days of settlement. And I guess some of the, as we walk along here, I'll sort of show you some of the early industrial manufacturing type of buildings that still remain here despite the skyscrapers overhead. For example, I'm just gonna pan up so you can see like the original skyline of Melbourne, the original buildings that are still here, but then of course surrounded by uh, many skyscrapers. A lot of our development in Melbourne at the moment is for um, international education. We, one of our big industries um, is attracting university students from overseas. They pay a lot more money, of course, than our students pay. And they, of course, need accommodation. They often work in a lot of the shops and cafes, and they kind of really contribute a lot to our um, economy. Yeah, so again, th these laneways are much more open. This one's just a new little place that's just open called Maker. I'm gonna actually go and check out their coffee later on today. Um, yeah, sort of one of the new kids on the block. Now I'm crossing Little Burke Street. So we were in Burke Street Mall where I, when we came out of Royal Arcade, and now we're crossing uh, Little Burke. And in fact, this one's the, no, that's right, it's the next one, isn't it? One of, the, one of the little laneways goes the other way, the one-way traffic. It's the next one actually along. A uh, little winery um, here called Yarra Ringing, Yarra, Yarra Yering. And that's actually where I, li I live out in the Yarra Valley, which is the main wine growing region of Victoria. And it's about 25 miles to the east of Melbourne. So to my right. Um, so that winery have actually brought just, um, you know, I guess the idea of wine tasting and a wine bar into, into Melbourne as well. So you don't have to go to the Yarra Valley to, to um, have that winery experience. It is a beautiful area of Melbourne as well. I'm just going to go a little bit further up here. Again, lunchtime is kind of just getting going. A lot of our workers have been asked to work from home again. So normally there would be, this would be yeah. just uh, quite constant with, with um, people along here. Yeah, no, I, should just, I just wanted to show you this place. It is closed at the moment, but Miznon is one of our really lovely Israeli restaurants. Actually, they do, they actually deliver your food. Well, even if you're sitting down, they present your food in um, a paper bag. Their signature dish is a cauliflower that they bake in the oven. And uh, yeah, it's just present you to the cauliflower in a paper bag that's absolutely delicious. Now I'm just gonna show you these buildings here. So these are very typical of perhaps a family business where they might've traded or manufactured something. So I'll just sort of start from the ground again. I'm just gonna show you, explain what these buildings um, were and are. Um, so here would be the main doorway. So you would have had your shop front, um, you know, perhaps glass or showcasing what you were doing there. Or if you're a, a blacksmith, you know, you might have just had those doors open and your forge would be down the bottom. You possibly would live on the next floor. So your house might be on that second floor. And then above is might be where you store your goods. Um, but you don't get them into your building through the doors. You've got that pulley um, under the, what's called the penthouse, that little veranda that's sticking out at the top is called a penthouse. And there's a little, um, a little hook on there and you would be hoisting your goods from street level off the wagon or off the horse, hoisting them up and then sort of doing whatever, processing them or storing them, preparing them for sale um, inside the building. But you wouldn't be trying to negotiate getting um, inside and up all the stairs. And that's very typical of um, many of these buildings along here. Yeah, a lot of, uh, there's some bespoke jewellers um, as well. It's not just restaurants and cafes along here. Again, in Melbourne, we have a say, we say, hide it, come and find it. The more things are hidden away and in pokey little places, the more we absolutely like it. One of my favourite 
cafes is in there. I'm just saying hello if they're not there. And I can't see uh, Peng at the moment. Peng is, um, she looks after me when I'm doing bike tours along here. Okay, so we're now coming up to Lonsdale Street. I want to take you down uh, one of our really, really, it's my absolute favourite favorite laneway in Melbourne. I'm just going to put myself back because it's just going to be a few minutes walk there and uh, let you know, Joel, has anyone got any questions at this point? Because I'm just going to have about two or three minutes of walking. So if anyone's got anything to ask, we can um, do that for a minute. Yeah. What is the temperature now there? Um, today it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit, um, about 30, 33 degrees Celsius. So a beautiful summer day. It's not too hot. It's very warm. I haven't got any, I don't need a jacket on or anything today. I'm just wearing a short sleeve dress. Uh, people are in shorts and jeans or shorts and t-shirts. It's a little bit breezy because Melbourne is situated on Port Phillip Bay, which is like the, a bay and the sea is not too far away. So certainly compared to where I live, even 25 miles away, it's usually warmer where I live because I haven't got the sea breeze. So I certainly feel that difference in temperature uh, when I come into the city um, each time, usually. And it's usually, yeah, usually, well, in summer, it's warmer where I live, but in winter, in winter, it's also a bit warmer as well. What is the temperature in the winter average? Uh, Snow-wise too. Right. Oh, yeah, look, winter, we don't get snow. We don't have any snow in Melbourne. The nearest snow would fall perhaps about 30 miles away. And even then, it would only be about every two years and just a very light sprinkling. And the kids would just go outside and make a snowman and then it would all be melted by lunchtime. But to go skiing, if you wanted to do downhill skiing, you've got to go about 100 miles. Sorry, if you want to do cross-country skiing, about 100 miles. And if you wanted to do downhill ski, you'd have to go about 300 miles. So it's still possible within a day. People, we do travel. We're used to traveling long distances. And I have lots of friends who love skiing and they would certainly go for a weekend or even a day trip, um, you know, just get up really, really early and come back really late. I actually work for a company that um, do ski tours, you know, day tours in winter. Um, so, yeah, it's very, it's possible. Um, but you know, we haven't got the snow, the, the high mountains on, on our doorstep, perhaps like other, other places. Do you have very many participants in the Olympics this year? Uh, I believe so. Yes, um, we do. Uh, probably the Winter Olympics is, we, is um, a little bit less. We have less participation in the Winter Olympics than the summer because things like swimming, we're very good at swimming and uh, the track events rowing um, when, when we started this morning I was when you're looking on the river you might have noticed some rowboats um, so yeah those sports are more because we have so much summer and good weather a lot of, and a lot of Australia is in sunshine for a lot of the year um, we have the, you know those sports are more are more our thing <laughs> here in in Melbourne and Australia, in Australia anyway yeah <clears throat> okay we're almost at our next laneway, which is called Guildford Lane. And this is, I think you'll really like this when I turn the corner. I'll just flip the camera so it's ready. There's some of that beautiful blue stone again. Again, not very, um, not very beautifully presented that blue stone, but it's, it's kind of, we call that rough dressed. That was a, just to sort of show you again, where are we? No, that way, sorry, so I've turned the camera. Um, that's called very rough dress. That used to be a stable. That used to be where horses, um, were stored, you know, or slept overnight. Now, as we come around here, this is just really, really pretty. It's quite different to something I've shown you before. It's called Guildford Lane. We'll just go up there a little bit. And all you really do feel like you're stepping back in time here. Um, mm -hmm. Elaine and Joel, did you find this one when you're in Melbourne? Not I sure don't if you found so. this one. Oh. No. And good this is one of. This is one of four laneways that um, the council have given money to, to green it up. So it's actually the, the laneway itself have been given money for all this beautiful 
you know, plants, a little bit of street art here where the, that's, that's actually drawn, all of that is street art drawn onto the wall there, but they've used the actual original door as well. And there's um, reference to the bees, the kind of bees amongst the plant, the painted bee, but among the plants. And what, I've got a friend who lives in this house here, actually, she just lives opposite there, Catherine. And she's been the one who's kind of led this project um, to green up the laneway in here. Very pretty. Well, actually just, it is really, really pretty. And it's been, they've had the money now for about four years. So they, you know, all the plants and plantings, they've, they've um, you know, they're really getting established now. A lot of the things are in pots, but then some things are climbing up the walls just to soften the industrial landscape. So the, all of these buildings you're looking at are like 1840s um, here. This is my, one of my favourite places, uh, Crimper Cafe. And I, can't, I won't go in because I'll lose the connection again, but towards the back, you might see a black... In the centre of the camera, there's a black box. Can you see that? It's got a picture of a face on the outside. Mm -hmm. And that is the original pulley lift um, of the building. They used to make furniture in that building. And you can actually walk or just if it's not busy, you can actually sit in the, sit in the lift, which is kind of a little booth, a little private booth to have your coffee or something like that. It's really nice. Now I'm just going to show you the other view coming down. Um, sorry, just got to, that camera just doesn't flip straight away sometimes. There we go. There we go. Coming down here, I'll just show you some of the plants up close as well. Yeah. Yeah, so people do live. There's a lot of people live in this street um, and there's a few businesses. It's not just sort of fly by nights. There's a real estate agent. There's two cafes. Our Lord Mayor pops into one of those cafes um, on her way to work on her bike every day sometimes see her and yeah it's just got a lovely sort of local community feel um, to it um, yes there is quite Arnold there is a thanks for the question Arnold we do have quite a Jewish community a large Jewish community in Melbourne uh, there we go we're out of the sun now aren't we there's a bright green building there and again I'm just going to show you the the tall buildings that are around us as well this little village <laughs> is surrounded by a most of these are apartments. Um, yeah, so Arnold, to get back to your question, post-World War II, um, as happened in many parts of the world, um, a very large um, emigration of Jewish people um, or even escaping um, you know, Nazism and so forth in Europe. And many Jews um, did come here to settle. Now, most of them live in an area called St Kilda, which is down by the beach. It's about five miles from... Melbourne City um, and also Caulfield so yeah and they certainly brought lots of of their traditions and customs which um, are, have been really amazing now I'm just going to take you a back road here because again I'm there's a lot of construction and if I go under the under the platform there I might lose the connection so I'll just go this uh, less interesting way um, yeah so they they brought food culture um, we have a really big Jewish museum um, we have a Holocaust museum, um, a, lo a lot of synagogues. We have quite have one synagogue in the city, and then those suburbs of Caulfield and St Kilda have synagogues. A lot of Jewish schools um, as well for um, children of Jewish people to have, sort of have that flavour of education as well. Um, certainly, there's both Orthodox Jews and um, you know perhaps non-practicing Jews as well. Um, one of my tour guide colleagues, um, probably her husband's more of a practicing Jew than she is. And I just want to show you a building here as well before we cross over. I'll just go down here. Um, yeah, but her father was one a very small child who escaped. Um, his mother virtually threw him off one of the uh, trains going to Auschwitz and his life was saved. So, so my colleague's father, you know, he... He was kind of spared and his, his family made it here um, to Australia as well. So, yeah, we really do have a lovely, rich Jewish culture um, here in Melbourne too. So I hope that answers the question. And I can't, I could probably, I'll have to just check up on numbers, you know, in terms of the demographic of how that compares um, with Melbourne's, you know, just that statistical figure. I can get back to you on that and let Joel know that I don't have that on hand. 
I actually think. participated. I participated in the census this year when the tour guide work really wasn't a lot of it. So I was actually part of you know collecting some of that data this year, but it hasn't been published yet. So our census is every five years, um, and yeah, it happened to be this year. I'm just going to show you, speaking of churches, I just want to show you a very modern church just in the middle of the road here. So we're back on Elizabeth Street here. It's going to turn around. So here we go. We're crossing now. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. Just <laughs> when I'm online with you, I've got to watch the steps. And I just uh, forgot the step there. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is a Coptic church. Egyptian Coptic church that is our newest church. It was only built in 2018. And it's, it's built into an apartment building, but the church takes up the bottom three levels. So there's retail on the bottom and then there's three levels, but it's quite an interesting building. Um, just go up a bit further so you can get the view here. Just turn the camera again. All right, so, oops, no, you're still seeing me. There we go. So you can see the arched windows. It's called the Aporo building and it's an Egyptian Coptic church. And you'll see the cross. You can see the cross that's been put into the bottom of the building and there's apartments above it. I think it's 43 levels. Yeah. But the, you, you can certainly see the religious um, symbol of a cross on the building. And then that area that's got the light stone and the arch windows um, is the actual church. So they owned um, the land and they wanted a church presence. Um, yeah, but they kind of, you know, they needed, I guess, the other income from apartment sales and some retail down the bottom to, to make that financially workable. Now, I'm working on the clock a little bit now, not, not because I want to go, but because I want to time our next um, site to be on the hour. So we're going to just make that, I think. Um, and this is again something Joel mentioned to me that I'm going to take you to show you um, a, a lead shot tower that's inside a building, but there's a clock in there that um, does a little animation right on the hour. So I do want to show you that. So I'm crossing Elizabeth Street again before we crossed it going west. Now we're crossing it going east and we're going to go into a building called Melbourne Central. I will just uh, flip the camera again when I get out of people's way. There we go. Now, you might be able to see up in the distance there, there's a building with, um, there's a crane, but can you see a building with a green, looks like, actually it's called the green brain. It's coming into view. It's kind of in, I'll try and keep it in the middle of the camera. The Green Brain, it's part of Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University. This was the university that I went to and my father went to and my nephew went to. So three generations of my family uh, went to this university. It started off as a working man's college. My father studied farming to be a dairy, dairy farmer there. I studied to be a librarian back in the 80s. My nephew has just completed um, a course in being a chiropractor so it's kind of become um, a more reputable academic institution over um, the years and it's sort of built from a more a technical university in fact where the crane is that was my building you always feel old don't you when your buildings are have been demolished <laughs> that you knew when you were younger so just before we head inside i just want to show you the reflection we go to look at that. You can see a cone mm -hmm. reflected in the glass there. And I'm going to show okay. you uh, what's under that cone when we go inside here. Now, I don't expect to lose you in here, but if we do, I'll be straight back just with the connection. It's usually okay. I've worked out ways to go and not go to make it, make it work. I normally would not take you into a shopping centre because it's not very interesting but oh I can hear the animation happening I better just quickly get around there to show you that here we go Oh, 
Now that's singing Walsh King Matilda, which is our unofficial national anthem. <laughs> I'll just. The birds, the birds down the bottom are sulfur crested cockatoos and crimson rosellas, so they're Australian birds. It actually goes through about uh, different keys, about seven of them. When it's going up, I'll go back there, but I'll just show you this in the meantime. So this is um, what's called Coop's Lead Shot Tower, a building that's been here since the 1890s, and it's under that cone. It's going to show you the going up now. Sorry, it's just going up. There we go. So it's a giant fob watch, and on the hour, um, it comes down and does this little song and animation of Walsing Matilda. Anyway, that's what that is. So where we're standing is we're actually on top of a an underground railway station, Melbourne Central. That's underneath. There's that beautiful blue stone again on the floor. And then we have this um, six-level shopping centre called Melbourne Central that surrounds um, the building. And then this lead shot tower, which was built to make lead shot. So what they would do, the engineers would take up molten lead right to the top of this tower, built in um, Italian Campanile style. When it was built, it was Melbourne's tallest building in the 1890s. And when you drop the lead, it actually forms a sphere shape and then that, it drops into a bucket of water and hardens. And that's how you'd make bullets um, for guns. So we had two of these in Melbourne and that was um, one of them. It's deemed to be a significant historical building. So the railway line underground, the shopping centre, and then this um, glass cone was put over it, but it was all designed to protect and really showcase um, this building. So it's quite a feature um, of Melbourne Central. The glass cone was designed and built by a Japanese, or designed, not built, designed by a Japanese architect um, whose um, modus operandi was uh, very much about um, things change and and there's architecture can show you the processes of life and change and kind of I guess his philosophy um, was yeah quite an interesting one that fitted in with the you know the, the what what they were looking for in designing this here there's just that fob watch again there yeah. and now, now we've just got I know we're just about on the hour Joel but I just want to take you out and show you the right. state library if that's okay is everyone okay with just a few more minutes yes, for sure yeah. this, this is terrific Leanne okay great <laughs> now until recently I'm just I'll actually just show you behind me as I'm walking along here um you'll see all this blue actually I'll just take you let me I'll, I will flip the camera around it's easier to show you I I actually went to see West Side Story uh, with a friend the other day. And one of the reasons I went was because um, on this wall here, every about every few weeks, they hand paint an advertisement for something that's happening. And they had uh, the, the, whole, the whole wall was designed for um, or painted to show, to advertise West Side Story, the, mm. the movie that Steven Spielberg's just released. And so, yeah, it's all hand painted. It's not, it's not sort of photographed and then they plaster uh -oh. it up. So what they're doing now, they're actually creating a new one. So you'll see all the markings that they're, they're, um, they've laid out. They've sort of laid out the design here. It's to do with recycled plastic mm -hmm. by the look of it. Um, and now if, if they were all here working and sometimes they are, there's about 20 artists lined up on the floor here with all their paint palettes and they're hand painting that. Only they only have it there for about 
um, perhaps four, four weeks, I think, would be about the most time that I've seen anyone. Oh, sorry, I was just flipping the camera again. Yep. Uh, about four weeks is about the most I've ever seen anyone keep a, an, an ad up there. So it's this huge amount of work hand painting it. It's there for about four weeks and then they just paint over it and do another one. So, yeah, it's kind of a bit interesting, I guess, that they, they don't just sort of put photographs of things there. All right, so what I'd like to show you to finish off, and again, we can have some discussion. So I'm just going to go another way just to give you a, a better view that way. Uh, yeah, and we'll see that green brain building a bit better too. Yeah, so the, the final building I'm just going to show you from the outside. I'd love to take you inside because I think it's one of our most beautiful buildings. It's the State Library of Victoria. Um, it's Australia's busiest library and it's also our oldest library. But the architecture is just really uh, kind of wow factor, but I'm not allowed inside to do any filming. So it'll just be from the outside. I can certainly send um, some, actually, I've, yeah, I can send some pictures of it um, again to Joel. Um, yeah, but I guess best of all is to come to Melbourne sometime and take a look inside too. Mm -hmm. So this is, I'm on Swanson Street now. This was the main north-south street. No. And I'm just going to show you that green brain again. Um, so that's part of Royal Melbourne. Is, uh, we call it RMITU, so university. That was, the building was actually built to be the Singer sewing machine factory. And now it's the, like the, um, the information hub for, for the university. So the main place where students go. Just an interesting sculpture here that's coming out of the ground. And it's actually a replica of the corner of the library building. Mm. I've had uh, some guests like yourselves from America who they really, this was about the only thing they wanted to see when they came to Melbourne <laughs> was this particular sculpture, which was a bit unusual. So you'll see there the word library. So it looks like the building's kind of just coming out of the ground. Just show you the longer view there. So yeah, but that's the actual library is just here and I'm going to just try and give you a lovely view of that with the sun shining off. So very uh, much the idea of a public library in Melbourne was there right from when um, Melbourne was settled. So Melbourne, as I said, settled 1835 and by 1854, the foundation stones for both Melbourne University which is our probably number one university and the State Library. They were both laid on the same day. And it's one of the, uh, it's in fact the only building in Melbourne that's set in the city, in the city itself, that's set um, quite a bit off, back off the street. So to really sort of set off and show off the, um, the architecture there. It's got those beautiful um, columns there and a bit of statuary out the front. I'll just show you perhaps the statue of our governor. There's someone sitting under it, but he was our first um, governor. And I'll just sort of finish near there so we can just have a chat for questions and all that sort of thing to finish off. So there's a man sitting under it, but that's, that's okay. So this, the street that we're facing here, where the green brain is again, between the green brain and us is Latrobe Street. And Latrobe um, was our first governor. So the first leader of... Melbourne and Victoria. So I'm not filming you. Um, I'm just going to just go above there. So it's a very colourful statue. And that's yeah. Governor Charles Latrobe reading out the proclamation that he's going to look after uh, Melbourne and the state of Victoria. Just as we finish, there's the cone again. You can just see the tip of the cone from Melbourne Central where we just were inside. And just, oh, there, there we go. There's the two towers, those two towers in the middle of the screen. They are the Eureka Tower and Australia 108. So that's uh, Australia's number two and number three tallest buildings. So the one on the right is actually taller, doesn't look at it from this perspective. And that's 103 floors. And the Eureka Tower goes to 92 floors. And there's an observation deck on the left one with the gold at the top. And that's, that means that's the highest vantage point in Melbourne. You can go up the top there. Uh, you have to pay for that and have a view um, over, over, over the whole of Melbourne, really. There. 
All right, well, look, I'll just say thank you so much for listening. You've been very patient um, listening to me talking for so long and hopefully showing you a bit of a snapshot of Melbourne. I'm just going to go and grab a seat over here. And if we've got any more questions um, and want to have any discussion about anything, I'm happy to hang around. Sorry, there we go. How many miles thank you, did you come? Thank you again. Thank you. How many miles did you walk? <laughs> How many miles did we walk today? Yeah. We're tired. Yeah, um, Oh, yeah. I'm, not too, I'm not too bad. Um, I do a lot of physical tours, you know, so I'm used to that. Um, we've walked where we started to where we finished. If we took a straight line, that's half a mile. But I think by the time we've weaved around a little bit, it would be closer to one mile. I deliberately make these virtual tours um, tighter in terms of the distance because otherwise we're walking, you know, without seeing much. If, if I don't sort of make a route where there's sort of interesting things every every minute or so um, like I know Joel mentioned the beautiful oh, Royal yeah. Exhibition building I'd love to take you there but it's, it's a good half hour walk you know perhaps from here or perhaps not half an hour perhaps 15 minutes and that's really a bit of a waste of your time so that would be better done on a separate tour for example yeah mm. does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Leanna about Melbourne or Australia yes her uh, I noticed while Leanne was walking through the city uh, that there was a lot of spray painted graffiti yeah. and a lot of buildings and structures. You have a problem like that? Look, I'd say we've had more of a problem since Definitely. COVID. Thank you, thank you for the question. More of a problem since COVID. Yeah. The, the idea of having um, some of our laneways for street, like kind of set aside for street art was to encourage the street art and the graffiti in those places and not on our you know more prominent beautiful places and that's worked to some extent but um sadly yes we do have um some graffiti and in fact i'd say to be perfectly honest with you our city does need a bit of a clean up and a tidy up um you know i think from covid there's just been less focus from our city council on keeping the city clean I guess the homeless problem has become a little bit more prominent um, and, you know, there's more people being disillusioned. We've had protests about anti-vaxxing and more recently Djokovic. So those things, I guess, you have the elements, the, the less desirable elements of, of um, demographic in the city a bit more as well. So that's my answer to that one. Yeah. Is that due to gang activity? Sorry, what was the question? I couldn't hear that. Is, is that due to gang activity or is that just sort of a resistance from the general population? Um, I mean, I caught the activity. Do, uh, do you mean the graffiti, no. doing the graffiti? No, gang activity, gang. G gay, gay people? No, no, no. 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 <laughs> Sorry, I'm just not hearing properly. G-A-N-G, gang. Oh, gang, gang. yeah. But, sorry, now I've got, sorry, I understood now. Um, no, look, we don't have a lot of um, gang activity. Um, we do have pockets of particular ethnic groups that sometimes get disillusioned and, um, you know, might break into... We've had a bit of a problem with people breaking into houses and taking their car keys and then stealing their cars. That's probably been the more prevalent crime in the last couple of years, not so much, you know, gangs... <laughs> Um, doing a lot of vandalism. We don't have too much of that. It's generally a very safe city. I, I would feel very, I feel very safe walking around the city any time of day or night, say up to about 11 o'clock at night. I would walk down any, any of the laneways, any of the main streets. I wouldn't give it a second thought on my own. I feel very safe in the city. I always have. Is there have. car jacking there? Like we have in Chicago? No, as I said, a little bit from people's homes. You know, sometimes... Um, people have broken into homes, grabbed the car keys and then smashed their cars through the garages. We've had a bit of that probably, oh, I don't know, perhaps for a while we're having that, you know, perhaps two or three times a week, but there's been less of it that I've heard about recently. Yeah. Zane, did you have something, Zane? Well, you did. Zane, you unmute yourself. Always the traffic uh, where, zoom, where, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Where in the area now do uh, the uh, Aborigine tribes live? 
Oh, yeah, look, that's a really good question too. If you visit Australia and you go to places like Uluru or Queensland or Darwin where it's very, the hot climates are a lot hotter, um, it's where a lot of our Indigenous Aboriginal people live and you will, overt, you will see very overtly our Aboriginal people and perhaps some of the um, troublesome <laughs> troubles that they still confront, you know, their trouble they have fitting into mainstream life. Um, sometimes there's a lot of drinking, um, a lot of unsocial behaviour. But in Melbourne, because the climate is generally cooler, um, we it's not sort of so it's, it's not so obvious. And also, Aboriginal people have assimilated and intermarried a lot more in Melbourne. So there are a lot of Aboriginal people who identify as Aboriginal in Melbourne, who they look like you really wouldn't tell them apart. Their hair colour and skin colour and um, the things they do in life is just the same as a lot of other people. They might identify as Aboriginal. You don't, there's not really any rules now, whether you, you know, like you don't have to be like a quarter or an eighth um, yeah. blood, so-called, you know, of, of Aboriginal right. blood. You, you can just choose to identify as Aboriginal yeah. if you've got that kind of history. Um, so yeah, not very obvious in Melbourne. There, are, there, there is a, I think it's about 3% of Melbourne's population would say they are Indigenous. Whereas if you went to Northern Territory, about 25% of people would say they are Aboriginal. So it varies a lot from the different parts of Australia. But a lot of um, cultural practices still happen. For example, the welcome to country, um, the acknowledgement of country. We have um, cer Indigenous ceremonies built into things like the opening of parliament and public events. So their oh, culture... culture. Sorry. Sorry, was there a question there? Sorry. No, I think it was some background noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I, sorry, I thought I interrupted somebody with their, no. yeah. Yeah, so they, no. they certainly like to practice their culture still as much as possible. Um, and we, I guess as a mainstream Australian society, we're really embracing that, you know, that knowledge and understanding a little bit more and I guess it's helping us a little bit more towards reconciliation too there's still there a lot a of hard feeling and um, yeah there's still problems with reconciliation and, and and land ownership those kind of things are still still issues that we're dealing with here as well okay is there anything else that someone wants to know when I ask the end anything else uh, I just it's wanted not. to tell her that I thought she did a great job. Yeah, yeah they were terrific. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, thank you. for sharing your city and country. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome, Joel. It's actually, people think, oh, it's easy doing a virtual tour, but you've actually got to be really aware of both the audience, but also my surroundings, you know, like not tripping down a step or something. And then, <laughs> yeah, really? You know, what's happened to us? <laughs> Um, so yeah, look, it's, it's, it's been lovely, a lovely way to still do some tour work, even though it's not the same. I'd love to have you all here, but um, it's really love been just a lovely way to connect. And I really, I'm still amazed that we can do this when we're halfway around the world. It's pretty amazing. Right. Yeah, it's <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you, Arnold. Thank and you. I will, I'll get back to Joel just on a couple of those things, like the, um, the Jewish numbers and a couple of those questions you asked me, I'll just uh, send those to Joel as a bit of a follow-up as well. And I sent the map out. Everybody should have gotten the map of some of the points that Leanne uh, showed us today. So it was, it was terrific. I want to thank you again and uh, wish you the best and uh, health. And, uh, and uh, hopefully one day uh, I'll get to see more of Australia. <laughs> Yeah, and I, hope, I hope you can do that because I bet you're missing travel. Yeah, Some of you would be missing your travel days that you, you oh, would love to have, I'm sure. For sure. Yeah. Yes, All right. that's All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Joel, so much. Thank you. Thanks for organizing. Thank you, Leanne. Okay. Okay. You're very welcome. Thank you. Good night. Bye, thank everyone. You. We don't have one now. Bye. Bye. A couple of days. Joel, we'll Joel just, did you get my check? Uh, no. Yeah. I'll say another one. Portion where the uh, where, where the roof was, and then we uh, we went back to Sydney and flew home from Sydney. Okay, you ready to leave? No, I didn't. Like no, I'll, I'll send you another one. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you. You hate Good to shout. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Well, they, that's what she showed. <laughs>